Welcome to another episode of Costume Co. In this first of a three-part episode, we look at the costumes of Westworld from season one. Warning, there will be major spoilers, Easter eggs, and lots of tin hat theories for the entire first season of Westworld. Some of the observations are my own and others I've acquired from fan theories and Reddit forums, so ultimately it will be for you to decide. Westworld is an American science fiction western thriller television series created by Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy for HBO. It's based on the 1973 film of the same name, which was written and directed by American novelist Michael Crichton, and to a lesser extent on the 1976 sequel, Future World. Costume designer Trish Somerville is responsible for the costumes of the pilot episode of Westworld, titled The Original. Somerville established the look for the show, including that of its central characters, Dolores, Teddy, the Man in Black, Maeve, and Clementine. Somerville is known for her design in the film world on the features Gone Girl, The Hunger Games, Catching Fire, and The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And as a side note, Somerville went on to design costumes for The Gunslinger and The Man in Black in an adaptation of Stephen King's The Dark Tower. The Gunslinger is the same name as the Yul Brynner antagonist in the 1973 Michael Crichton feature. And the Man in Black is the name given to Ed Harris's mysterious character in HBO's Westworld. Costume designer Anne Crabtree picked up the torch from Somerville after the pilot episode and designed the remaining nine episodes in season one. Crabtree says, I love Trish. She did a beautiful job and at a net breaking pilot's pace. I think every decision she made was dead on. Crabtree did an amazing job of seamlessly bridging the looks together between the pilot and the rest of the nine episodes of Westworld, season one. Crabtree was nominated for her work on Pan Am, and most recently she received an Emmy nomination for Hulu's The Handmaid's Tale. Interestingly, Crabtree went up against Somerville, who was nominated for an Emmy for the Westworld pilot. The Emmy went to costume designer Michelle Clapton for The Crown. According to the original story written and directed by Michael Crichton, Westworld was set in the near future. The time period of the HBO series, however, is less certain. The story, as we learn after viewing season one, takes place over a 35-year time span. There was an Easter egg in the HBO run DallasIncorporated.com, which shows the date of Maeve's escape from the park as June 15, 2052. That would date the start of the park as 2018, which seems oddly early given the advanced technology. Therefore, I won't assign any specific timeline to any of the park staff or guests, because Westworld could be in an alternative reality, or even off-planet for all we know. Showrunners Lisa Joy and Jonathan Nolan have indicated that we will learn more about the whereabouts in Season 2. Delos Destinations Incorporated is a subsidiary of Delos Incorporated, which directly oversees their primary vacation site, Westworld. Wealthy guests pay $40,000 a day to attend the park. The corporation runs its theme park from highly advanced control rooms and maintenance facilities, making sure that everything is in accordance with guests' needs. The control room in Westworld looks similar to the control room seen here in The Hunger Games. The game operators also wear white uniforms like the lab technicians, this one of the Westworld technician from a flashback sequence. With its punches of red, it also looks remarkably similar to the carousel, which is the amphitheater-like ceremony room in the 70s sci-fi thriller Logan's Run. The last day participants are all dressed in white unitards with accentuated red flames. The technological world of Westworld also brought to mind the underground compound in the 2005 sci-fi thriller by Michael Bay. In a story of not everything is what it seems, the compound's inhabitants, dressed in white jumpsuits with contrasting panels, learn that they are clones intended for organ harvesting. The hosts in Westworld are actually synthetic humans and dress in stark white for the arrival of the human guests on the train platform. 
in a way like stormtroopers who have a biochip implanted in order to ensure their compliance. Alternatively, at night, both male and female hosts dress completely in black. The costume design of these two distinct worlds also reminds me of Star Wars in the way that costume designer John Mollo tackled it. Brandon Allinger, author of the Star Wars original trilogy costumes, wrote, Mollo says that at Lucas's suggestion, his costumes were designed to be color-coded so that the good guys wore organic colors and earth tones and the bad guys wore more technological colors in black and gray. There are exceptions to the association of evil with technology, however. Mallow notes that while Luke's Star Wars 1977 outfit is actually a light tan, Leia's dress is a stark white, making her as part of the technological world as well. According to production designer Nathan Crowley, the Old West theme park is set in the 1890s. Black and white costumes are used liberally throughout the show, both in the backstage areas but also in the park itself. Both Dr. Ford and The Man in Black are prime examples of this. Perhaps the black and white palette is not surprising since nothing can be assumed or taken as it is on the surface. Even guest Logan, who also dress in all black, and William are dressed in the black and white palette. This is in turn a striking contrast to the park hosts, who are all dressed in white. The designers were challenged in creating the largely technological backstage world of Delos Destinations and the onstage world of the theme park Westworld. Trish Somerville said in an interview with Costume Designer Guild back in June, I tried to keep things authentic to a degree, changing silhouettes or the fabrication a bit, and it was also exciting because I got to do different worlds. In working with the showrunners, Anne Crabtree had to ask, what is modern that is timeless and classic in creating this undefined period of the technological world? Crabtree drew of her love of Japanese designers and certain creative moments in time, artistically all kind of meshed together, along with the Bauhaus movement and the 1900s in Vienna for the future side of Westworld. Dr. Robert Ford's costume was established in the pilot by costume designer Trish Somerville. According to Anne Crabtree, it's his character that has established the look for the park, that everything is custom-made and old-fashioned saying. For us, it was, a, it was how would someone like Robert Ford dress. He's come up with this idea that everything should be bespoke and that everything should be very old-fashioned. It made perfect sense to create him as an old-school gent who wore proper shoes and waistcoats and jackets and, yes, a hat. She adds, I know there were moments in which Anthony would have loved different versions of things that were 1800s or 1900s, but we didn't want to go too far. But because he is a mysterious creator and we don't know quite what the genesis is of Robert Ford, the black and white thing, that very simple thing, is a way to keep him not one thing or the other. He's just a magician. He's a person in black and white and you'll notice details, but you won't know exactly where he's headed. While throughout the season we were trying to decipher whether Ford was an antagonist, his costume might have told a different story. He always wears a white shirt under his dark exterior, like the lovable rogue Han Solo, indicating that he was always well-intentioned. In this alternative timeline, we see a youthful Dr. Ford, some 30 plus years back, where he wears a slightly more contemporary version of his present day clothes. For instance, he doesn't have a notched collar in his vest or a pocket watch. One of the more curiouser things I came across is that Robert sometimes wears a wedding ring and other times he doesn't. So in these images, for instance, he's not wearing a wedding ring. While in all of these images he is. There was a scene that was cut where Robert Ford explains to Teresa that at one point he was married, but she wanted to have children and he didn't, thinking that the hosts were his children. So there's a few possibilities. It's merely a continuity error. Anthony Hopkins is wearing his personal wedding ring and forgot to take it off in a few scenes. Or these are two separate individuals, one host and one man.
You can see that actor Anthony Hopkins' wedding ring is a simple gold band. I've identified at least four vests on Dr. Ford. This one is very unique and nothing like anything I've seen before. So there's a flap of fabric and it's turned up at the bottom, creating these low pockets in the front for which he stores his pocket watch. Here's a zoomed in image of the fabric. And if you look closely, you might find that the pattern resembles a maze. In this look, while Dr. Ford is lunching with Teresa, he removes his tie and unbuttons the top button of his soft gray vest, showing his more casual side. But as we learn, we know that this lunch is anything but casual. When asked in a hidden remote interview if Robert's pocket square was intentionally the same color as Dolores' dress, Anne Crabtree said before the season finale, it's definitely close in color to Dolores' dress. If that's exactly intentional, I can't say. But I will say that a pocket square is a very perfect, clean, simple touch to add to Robert Ford as a real thing for him to use. But also, it is a touch that says there is a man who is aware of what a true gentleman wears. And after the, reading this interview, I'm pretty certain that the color was indeed purposeful. Robert wears this black felt hat in many of the exterior scenes. I think his hat looks like this Stetson straddle liner fur felt fedora like this one seen here. Here's a close up of the herringbone fabric and the fabric covered buttons of his soft gray vest. Here's a good head to toe shot of Robert. His pants are cut very high and sit on his natural waistline, as you would see in the 1800s, with belt loops, although he always wears suspenders. And while we never see them, it makes sense to me that the on-site wardrobe in the Westworld backstage area of the park would tailor clothes specifically for Dr. Ford, in the same manner that they create custom clothes for the guests. This is another vest made from a different fabric, although it's cut exactly the same way as Robert's other vest. One of the things I notice is that in this scene and the one that follows, Robert positions his pocket watch in his left pocket, which seems odd since he is right-handed. The show is so careful in its placement of symbolism that to me, it would seem unlikely that this is merely a continuity error. Just to make things really confusing, Robert uses his right hand to shake Bernard's hand and here taking notes in his book. Therefore, the watch should be in his left pocket and not his right. Here's the same vest and tie, but with the pocket watch on the other side. A pocket watch placement like this indicates that Robert is actually left-handed. Here's an example of a vintage chain and fob. The fob is the name of the ornament hung at the end of such a chain. The T-bar is inserted into the buttonhole to hold the chain in place. Here's a close-up of Robert's watch chain and fob with the pocket watch sitting in his right pocket. You can also see that the pattern on his vest looks a bit like a pyramid, like the one he draws on the chalkboard depicting the bicameral mind. Here is another vest entirely. It's cut the same way as the other two vests, but it's made from a charcoal gray herringbone fabric, like his soft gray vest. Notice that his fob is sitting higher. And you'll also notice that we get a little peek or uh, a little shot of his suspenders. For the finale, Robert wears a classic black double-breasted tuxedo with a satin notch lapel collar. This is a bit more of a 40s look, so I'm not sure why they went in this direction considering his other clothes. With Bernard, I feel he looks a bit more old-fashioned because, in a sense, he's based upon Arnold, who is close in age to Dr. Ford. Anne Crabtree says, I think the idea was we wanted a veil over Bernard as we didn't want folks to understand that he was a host. And yet, because he is sort of an in-betweener, in between human and host, he had to be less than Ford, obviously. The majority of Arnold's clothes are variations of blue and a wide variety of textures. Again, I think this is a purposeful decision by the design team. Here's a close-up shot of Arnold's glasses. According to actor Jeffrey Wright, Bernard's reading glasses are from iBob's, which is an online glass supplier. It led me to this pair, and after careful examination, I'm pretty sure they're the same. The name of these little of these limited edition glasses crack me up. They're called Little Pecker. 
The description states, these retro reading glasses have all the style of peckerhead in a pinhead size. Bernard even entertains and sleeps in blue. When I first looked at these pictures after I knew that this was actually Arnold in a flashback, I thought he was dressed in a black jacket, but then I realized that he's actually wearing a black lab coat over top of his blue shirt, which is why it's cut a little bit differently than his other coats. Anne Crabtree confirms this by saying, Ford is more tied to the past in the style of his dress, and Jeffrey Bernard was mostly in the beginning in this futuristic part of the park behind the scenes working. So I approached that everyone is in black. They're in these textural lab coats and really clean lines and Jeffrey is in that version, but higher up, a bit more 60s. Maeve wears a slightly modified version of the Delos Technician lab coat here. Another thing that I notice is that he also wears glasses and it looks like they are the same ones as Bernard's. The other thing is that Arnold has the same gold wristwatch as Bernard. This must mean that Ford either kept these personal items of Arnold's or he had them reproduced. Here's another look at Arnold just before Dolores kills him. Arnold also wears suspenders. I think that Lee Sizemore's costumes are very classic looking and might be referred to as business casual since he rarely wears a suit or tie. His colors are in gray and blue tones and he often wears sweaters in contrast to Dr. Ford and Bernard. As head of security, Stubbs wears all black, sometimes with a bit of blue like with this sort of typical off-duty police officer look. I don't have much to say about it. His clothes are pretty standard, practical attire. The persons in Stubbs' security detail, however, wear tactical body armor. As we move into Season 2, we should expect to see more of this type of thing. There's not too much to say about Elsie's attire, really. She's sticking to the black theme color. Her costumes look functional yet professional for the kind of work that she does in the behavior lab and diagnostics department that also occasionally involves field work. This is also indicated by her no-nonsense hairdo, which is always slicked back into a neat ponytail. Felix and Sylvester are technicians in the Livestock Management Division, sometimes referred to as the Body Repair Shop. Of their look, Trish Somerville says, They treat the bodies at times like they're in a slaughterhouse, so I made everything out of latex and rubber. The idea was that they would just hose themselves down after each body, incorporating the deep red of blood makes it scary, and having high boots make you wonder how deep is the carnage when you have boots that high. It's quite a departure from the 1973 Westworld where the technicians wear white surgeon's scrubs or lab coats because with Crichton's androids there's really no blood or gore to deal with. This is not the case with the synthetic humans of the HBO series. The red of their costumes almost look like the aprons and sleeve covers have been dipped in blood. They also wear latex gloves and face shields to protect themselves from blood splatter. In this close-up of Sylvester, we see that the collar is affixed at the side and the yoke of his costume has tears. Here's another look at it except that Maeve has it draped on backwards. And if you look closely, you'll see these little plastic dome closures, which would be done up at the back. Without the apron on, we can see that the pleather gown is the color of bone. Immediately when I saw the robes, I thought of the Garrick or Coachman's coat, a man's outer garment popular during the Victorian era. Anne Crabtree says of the theme park technicians. So the initial surgeons in red and white, those were designed by a combo of Jonathan Nolan and Trish Somerville. The new characters you see in episode four, that is a further idea to the people in the pilot. Those guys are maybe like the garbage men. They clean the hosts up that are badly hurt and they take them and bring them back to the body shop place and reset them. They're the guys that are not the lowest end of the totem pole, but they are there to pick up dead bodies. These costumes are actually different from the lab techs. They wear a one-piece jumpsuit, sort of like a Tyvek environmental suit, except that it appears to be made of cloth. And they wear a separate disposable head cover and latex gloves, 
followed by red latex sleeve protectors, a white latex apron, and red rubber boots and a face visor. I really like Teresa's clothing. Like Lee Sizemer, her costumes look corporate yet classic. Her colors are in blues and blacks with a, you know, a little bit of white, like in this blouse we see here. And if I was to date her look at all, I'd say it looks 80s, especially this blue, black, abstract printed dress here. One thing that I've noticed is that like other female characters, that she wears no jewelry except for this one signature ring on her right hand. Her cigarettes and lighter seem to be her main accessory. I was a bit confused that in the future anyone would smoke, especially since disease has been eradicated. However, I don't think it's ever mentioned if she's smoking tobacco or not. If I had to quibble with any of the costumes, it would be with Charlotte Hale's look. So don't get me wrong, actress Tessa Thompson is gorgeous and she looks amazing, but the clothes look so current, like 2018 current. I mean, check out these gladiator heels. Invisible zippers will be a definite giveaway. It might have been better to ax any visible closures altogether like they do in Star Trek. This is the funny thing about fashion. What might look timeless and contemporary today will look dated 10 years from now. All of these structural darts and seaming give her a very contemporary, less classic look. Science fiction movies and shows often get it wrong, but occasionally you'll have a masterpiece like Blade Runner or Alien that does a really great job of keeping things timeless. I hope you enjoyed the first part of my three-part episode on the costumes of Westworld. In part two, I examined the costumes of the guests. I hope to have that out later in the week. Make sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a thing. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below. And if you find value in my videos, consider supporting me on Patreon. I want to do a quick shout out to my one and only patron, Pegleg Pete. Thank you so much for your support.